So I believe uh, that the Lord's plan has always been for us to have a, a house that's had a solid foundation. In fact, um, there's a, an Old Testament scripture that says this, unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers will labor in vain. And so though he might use pieces in the puzzle to build the house, one of the pieces that he uses is mothers. Uh, let, let's take a look at some of these things this morning and i'm going to take you back in time a little bit so if you go back and if you're familiar with the genesis text genesis chapter one genesis chapter two uh, you remember from the very beginning that it was god's plan for one man and one woman so that's when he created man and he said it's not good for a man to be alone so he gave man a helpmate so he takes from this one man and makes a woman and then he says, the two shall become one flesh. And so we call that holy matrimony. We call that where husband and wife become one flesh. This is God's plan from the very beginning. Genesis 1-2 is one man, one woman. So the result of becoming one flesh, God said, be fruitful and multiply. And so that is saying when the, the male and female become one flesh, now they have the ability to reproduce. And so... The byproduct is children. So now you have a mother, father, and children. That's God's plan from the very beginning, Genesis 1-2. And then he goes on, and, and, and here's some of the, the really key foundational pieces. If you go back and you look at Genesis 1 and 2, it said that God walked with Adam and God talked with Adam. And so from the very beginning, his plan for a healthy foundation or solid foundation for the family was his word. So God was talking to his creation. And the creation had the ability to actually talk to him. And so Adam in the garden was talking to the creator. Genesis 1 and 2, this is God's plan. This is the original plan that God had created. One man, one woman, two becoming one flesh. Byproduct is be fruitful and multiply. They bring children into the world have the ability to talk to the creator and have the ability to hear from the creator. That's, that's, that's a perfect plan. But if you're familiar with the scriptures, then you see that in Genesis chapter 3, we call this the fall of man. And the reason why we call this the fall of man is because man, who had already heard from God, chose not to listen to God. In fact, he is absent, he's, he's not on the scene because now his wife, Eve, begins to dialogue and talk with the serpent. Now the serpent is crafty and the serpent has God's word and he twists it just a little bit. It's called the deceiver. Sounds right, but in reality it's not God's word. So man and, and his wife, they chose not to listen to God, they chose to listen to the deceiver. And the result is sin. Sin has now entered into God's perfect plan. In fact, it's now the foundation has been laid, but now there's a crack right in the middle of this house, of this family. In fact, the very, uh, if you follow the, the, the narrative in, in Genesis, then you see that they do have the byproduct of being fruitful and being and multiplying, they have two boys, blessings. Children are blessings from the Lord. But in just one chapter, you see, because they rebelled against God and they began to do it the deceiver's way, you see the breakdown in the home and you see the crack in the foundation. So we get the record of the first murder that's ever recorded in Scripture. And that's interesting because the murder that happens in Scripture is actually from brothers. The family foundation has a crack in it. And now the family that God had originally planned is it's broken. So you fast forward now and you begin to see that all of humanity now has this huge crack in the foundation. And judges, let me uh, let me kind of walk you through because I'm actually setting the. The table for the sermon. So, if you're familiar with the, 
the Old Testament. This is kind of the, the outline or the overview of how it goes. So you have Genesis, the creation, Genesis 1, Genesis 2. You have fall, Genesis 3. Then you have all the way through the book of Genesis, and you have what's called the book of Exodus. Then you have the book of um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. <laughs> then you have Numbers. Then you have Deuteronomy. Then you have Joshua. And then you get to the book called Judges. So in the book of Judges, it's interesting because because of this foundation, this crack in the foundation, the nation has begun to drift from God and, and his word. In fact, the government is corrupt. Um, the religious institution is corrupt. In fact, this one verse in Judges 21, 25 sums up the whole book, of, sums up the whole people. It says, in those days, Israel had no king. And everyone did as they saw fit. Some translations say that everyone did what was right in their own eyes. They no longer had a moral compass. They no longer knew right from wrong. They were basically doing whatever they wanted to do. And the nation was in disarray. Now, just to, just to bring this home a little bit, let's think about our current culture. <clears throat> Would we... Would you say that our current culture buys into this philosophy? That everyone does what's right in their own eyes? We've begun to redefine marriage. Because, see, when man says that it is a man-made institution, then man has the freedom to redefine marriage. But it's not a man-made institution. We saw in Genesis 1-2 that it was God's plan for man and woman Two shall become one. It was God's plan. So if it's God's plan, we don't have the authority or the ability or the right to redefine marriage. It's already been defined by our creator. But in our culture, we live in a culture that begins to redefine things. In fact, these people said they had no king. um, But in fact, they really did have a king. Yahweh was their king. But they wanted to be like all the other nations because all the other nations had human kings. And so they said, we want a king. We want a king. We give us a king. And God was like, hey, wait a second. I am ultimately your king. And that's kind of similar to us today, though we don't live in a monarchy. We don't have kings. We want a president to lead us. And so we get all stirred up because we want the best president to lead us. And the fact of the matter is every person on the planet is sinful. They just disguise it better than others. And so we might put someone in office thinking they're going to come and save the day. But in reality, they're never going to save the day. There's only one person that can save the day, and that is God. And so when you look at Genesis 21 and 25, you begin to see that the the culture has shifted dramatically from God and his word. And they're doing everything according to their own way. And yet we're going to see one imperfect family that chose to go against the flow of the culture and to rebuild their family foundation. And so if you were tracking, so you had Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, then you have um, Joshua, Judges. Remember that verse we just read? Then the next one is Joshua, Judges, Ruth. Then you have 1 Samuel, And this is where our story takes place this morning. Ooh, that's going to be hard to read that last verse, but it's okay. So in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 3, it says, um, year after year, and this, this, and okay, I just want to tell you, I don't know how to say some of these names. So the guy that we're talking about, his name is Elkaniah. I'll call him that. Okay, so Elkaniah, you have to go back and look at 1 and 2, but it's picking up in 3. This is what Elkaniah does in verse 3. It says, year after year, this man, Elkaniah, he went up from his town and notices what he does in a culture that is shifted away from God. He worships and he sacrifices to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Now, hold on to those two names, because in a moment we're going to see just who these two men were, Hophni and Phinehas. Verse four. Whenever the day came for Elkaniah to sacrifice, he would give 
portions of the meat to his wife Panea and to all her sons and daughters. Verse 5 says, But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her. And the Lord had closed her womb. Did y'all catch that, what I just read? So in one verse, it says that he has a wife. Her name is Panea. And he gives her a portion. This is his wife. And he gives her a portion and to her children. But then the very next verse says that he gives a double portion to Hannah because he loves her. Er, wait a second. Put the brakes on for a second. Hold on a second. You said in the beginning that God said that there should be one man, one woman. All of a sudden now, this guy has one wife, two wives. He's already going against the flow just like the culture because that was not God's original plan in the beginning. You know why it's, it's important not to have two wives? Because you have two mother-in-laws. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's bad. Okay. Mother-in-laws are good. But here, this guy has two wives, and it's interesting because one wife has kids, and he doesn't refer to them as his kids. He says, her kids. It says in verse 5, but he, but, okay, excuse me, verse 4, he would give portions of meat to his wife, Panea, and to all her sons and daughters. That's interesting. I, 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 we don't have enough information to, to say why not his sons and daughters, a lot of scholars believe that he first married Hannah, and Hannah was his true love. But Hannah could not have children. And in this time in the culture and society, bringing forth children, especially a son, was very important because you would be able to pass along your inheritance, pass along your, your lineage, and pass along your family name to a son. And if you did not have a son, then you would scramble for plan B. And you see if you go back in the Genesis account, you see Abraham does something very similar to this. He's married to Sarai. She can't have babies. And so he takes a maidservant and he ends up having children with Hagar. And if you look at that scenario from Abraham and Sarah and Hagar, it doesn't end up well. There's always tension in the home. Fast forward. There's still tension in the home. Why? Because in verse 6, because the Lord had chosen to close Hannah's womb... Her rival, Panea, kept provoking her in order to irritate her. Now, this went on year after year. And whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her until she wept and she could not eat. Even godly families can have cracks in the foundation because you saw here that they worship God. They loved God. And yet they were so influenced by the culture that they had a crack in their foundation too now let me just show you a couple of these cracks in the foundation here it says uh, sexual morality can destroy a home probably for us we're not going to go out men we're not going to go out and have multiple wives that's probably not going to take place but if you remember in genesis 1 and 2 it's one man one woman two shall become one flesh the marriage bed is considered holy it's sacred now we might not go off and have multiple wives, but we might still fall into sexual morality. And sexual morality can and will destroy a home. My old pastor uh, said it this way, and I, I love the visual he said. He said that sex in the context of the way God had planned it, in the context of marriage, is like a fire that will be placed in a fireplace in your home. It is contained it is put in the place where it's properly supposed to be and it will bring warmth to the house and everyone in the house will be warmed up by this fire. But you take that same fire and you take it out of its original context of where it should be placed and it will destroy a home. In fact, if you go by and you see a house that's been burned down, what is the last thing that is remaining? Fireplace. Fireplace. Because the fireplace was designed for the fire. But you take that fire out and it can literally destroy a home. 
The same thing with sex. Sex in the context of God's plan is a good thing. It is a healthy thing. But you take it out of context and it can destroy a home. And so the warning for us this morning is to watch these cracks in our own foundation. Wanted, waiting on a child can be painful. This lady, uh, for whatever reason, her womb was closed. She loved God. And for whatever reason, the Lord chose to close her womb. If you go and you look at the, the ladies in the Bible, you will see that a lot of the godly women, for whatever reason, God had chosen to close their wombs. We don't understand from a human perspective why this takes place. But if you go and you look at the rest of the story, you see that God used these wombs that were closed to bring forth his plan. And we will see in a little bit what God's plan for Hannah was. Then abuse. Abuse also um, was taking place in the home. There was two ladies rivaling with one another. She was constantly provoking her. Some of us, uh, well, I would, let me rephrase that. All of us have grown up in families of abuse. We probably just don't know it. There's all sorts of types of abu- abuse. There's physical abuse. Did y'all hear that story about some of these kids that were tied up last week at, here? I think it was in San Antonio, somewhere in Texas. I mean, this was... So you have these families that have extreme abuse, but there's also sexual abuse, there's verbal abuse, there's all sorts of abuse. We're all, unfortunately, part of this uh, crack in the foundation because of sin That's a result of broken homes. So let's continue reading here. Um, And just, I got to apologize to you because there's a lot of text here. So just bear with me because there's a lot of text. I think it's like 20 something verses. So I'm going to do my best to to go through all these verses with you. Okay, so verse nine. So once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. And no razor will ever be used on his head. There's two things that happen in this little verse. One is that she prays. And the second thing is she's actually making a vow to God. And the vow that she is making is called a Nazarite vow. We'll look at that one second. It's coming up. So here's the the Nazarite vow. It's found in the book of Numbers, chapter 6. So do y'all remember the, the, the judge by the name of Samson? Okay. What was Samson known for? Strength and what else? Long hair, right? And so the big deal is like, don't cut his hair. You know, why can't you cut his hair? Well, he actually was a Nazarite. He made an, his mom made a Nazarite vow for him. A Nazarite vow was basically that you are not going to cut your hair. And you're not going to drink any type of fermented drink, so no alcohol, no wine, nothing of that. You're going to be set apart. And you could not be around anything, uh, anyone that was dead. So if someone died, you couldn't touch them or you become unclean. This was a a Nazarite vow. So here, this woman knows her Bible because she is remembering Numbers chapter 6. And she says, this is found in the word of God, and I'm going to make this vow for my child. If you give me a child, Lord then I'm going to fulfill this Nazarite vow. Now, this is a big, big commitment because basically she's saying, if God, if you'll give me a child that I so desperately want, I will give him back to you for your work. Now, most moms who cannot bring forth a child want a child, but they want a child for themselves. It's a natural thing. And she, you know she wants a child for herself, but she's saying, God, if you'll just give me a child, 
I will give him back to you. And it's a reminder that children are really belong to the Lord. Proverbs 22, verse 6 says that parents are to train a children, their children in the ways of the Lord. And when they're old, they will not depart from it. Let's, let's keep reading because we have a lot of verses here. So as she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. And not so, my Lord, Hannah replied, I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Just a quick footnote here. And verse 15 says, I am a woman who is deeply troubled. And yet I have not been drinking wine or beer. Our culture tells us when you're deeply troubled, what do you, how do you handle your problems? <laughs> go, go to happy hour. <laughs> you know, just you just need something to relax. Hannah could have gotten drunk. She's just desperate for a child. She's troubled. She's miserable. But yet she's like, oh. Instead, I'm going to turn my, my heart to the Lord. Guys, if you got some troubles going your way, don't turn to an addiction because that's not going to solve your problems. God is going to solve your problems if you come to him. So verse 16, she's concerned about her character. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you for what you have asked of him. And she said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. And then she went her, her way and she ate something and her face was no longer downcast. And early in the next morning, they rose and they worshiped before the Lord. And then they went back to their home in Ramah. And Elkaniah made love to his wife, Hannah. And the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And she named him Samuel saying, because I have asked the Lord of him. God hears our prayers. God heard this woman's prayer. God answers prayers. Now, maybe God will answer a prayer in the biological sense because this woman wanted a child and she brought forth a child. God brought forth a child through her. But maybe God could answer a prayer through adoption. I know God answered my wife's prayer. My, my wife is a mother of four. And we have three biologicals. And one adopted. And yet all four of them are belong to us. So God can answer a mother's prayer. In various ways. In fact if you heard my wife's story. She will tell you that. She would pray and she would cry out to God and cry out to God and cry out to God because she wanted a child. And she would also cry out to God and cry out to God and cry out to God because she wanted her husband to be on board with her heart. And so here I am, the husband, and I'm like, you know, I don't know if, if adoption is for us. And God didn't speak audibly, but he spoke to my wife her spirit and he said just stop bugging your husband he didn't say that he just said uh, stop asking your husband and he said he said just pray so my wife started just praying for me and god aligned my heart and of course we brought forth our our child or his child did you know that san antonio this is a this is mother's day but this is also uh, the month that we recognize orphans and did you know that san antonio has thousands and thousands and thousands of kids that would love to have a home and here's the irony of the whole thing there's a lot of parents that would love to have children and there's a lot of children that would love to have a home and 
possibly, maybe, maybe God would allow some of you to adopt or maybe God will allow some of you to foster. I would ask you guys to pray about that. I met with a, a lady a couple of days ago and praying about our church partnering with this ministry. It's called Angels Crossing. And Angels Crossing is about a mile and a half on 471 from our future property. And it is a faith-based agency that works with foster parents. And what Angie, the director, told me, she said, um, if you know of two people in your church, husband and wife, that would love to foster, they said, we will actually build them a house and we will give them a stipend and all they would have to agree to is be foster parents for these children because there's no longer these group homes like there used to be and so now they're changing these things up to now they're having these homes that can can sleep sibling groups you know four to six kids i think it's four to six but maybe some of you are in this room maybe it's not now but i would encourage you to pray how god might be able to use you in this area so I would also include you, if you have kids in your, in your own home, um, to start modeling your faith. I'll, I'll be a little transparent with you here. Um, this is something that my family and I need to work on. We, we've gone through seasons where we've done a really good job, where we have sat around the table and we've read the scripture together. My kids now are in public school, and, um, and it's been a, a blessing but our schedule is all over the place with Little League, with T-ball, with, you know, mom working and homework and all these things. You know, the first thing that typically gets pushed to the side is family time with the Lord. We make time for a lot of other things, and I promise you tonight I will make time for the Spurs. And so will a lot of you. And yet, for some reason, we can't find family time to open up God's word. And so just a reminder, um, Hannah and her husband Elkaniah, they spent time worshiping, praying, and God brought forth them a son. Now let me um, just kind of bring it full circle here. Before we look at Samuel, I need to touch base with you about these two boys, Hopfinny and Phineas. If you go and you f and read the next couple of chapters, you realize that these two boys, their sons of the priest, Eli, are wicked men. Here's the interesting thing about these two boys. Their mom is never mentioned once in the scripture. Whether or not they have a mom, whether or not she's just disconnected, we don't know. But she is not mentioned at all in the scripture. We do know that these two boys are very wicked and they are religious leaders. This is how they are wicked before the Lord. You see how we have greeters that greet people that come in. They had people that would welcome people into the tent. And so these these boys that are priests would have sexual relations with these women who were welcoming people that would come in to, to worship at the tent. They were also allowing people to bring forth their sacrifices and they would take animals, they would sacrifice animals and they would put them there and they were supposed to have offered up God the very best part of the sacrifice and then they were to take whatever was left over and they were doing the opposite. They were taking the very best for themselves. They were robbing God. They were robbing others of their sacrifice. They were getting fat on the provisions of others. They were very wicked. So God says, I'm not going to let this take place anymore. I'm going to destroy these two men, and he does. Now, here's the interesting thing. Remember, Hannah makes this vow before the Lord, that if you will just give me a son, I will give him back to you. So at the age of three, he's able to eat solid foods on his own. At the age of three, they go to worship. And she takes this little boy, and guess where she takes him to? To this priest, Eli, and his corrupt sons. And she turns him loose and she trusts the Lord. And so you begin to follow Samuel's life story and you realize that he actually becomes a prophet. And he becomes a priest. 
and he becomes the last judge over all of Israel. And many scholars believe that he is the one that should have been the first king of Israel, not Saul. But the scholars will quickly come back and say he could not have been the first king of Israel because he would have worn all three titles. He would have been the prophet, the priest, and the king. And that those three are reserved for only one person, that is Jesus. Jesus is our high prophet. He is our high priest, and he is the king of kings and lord of lords. And so if you fast forward and you look at this guy, Samuel, then he becomes all these things, and he begins to turn the nation back to God. You see, this woman just wanted a baby, but God saw a bigger plan. God said, I will give you a baby, but if you give him back to me, then I'm going to let him lead my people back to me. And that's the same true with Jesus is that our nation is still corrupt. Our nation is still falling apart. And yet we have one son that God the Father has given us that will lead us back to himself, that will turn this nation around. But we as his people have to be willing to follow him and not the world's way. And who knows, maybe, maybe some of you moms today have children in your homes and maybe you have not dedicated them to the Lord. And I'm not si- simply saying you come up here and we say a prayer over them and we take some pictures and we smile. And this was our ceremony where we dedicated our kids to the Lord. But, but rather you as moms and you as dads say, no, these children belong to you, God. And I'm going to do my best to point them to you, God, because you have a plan for them. And who knows what their plan, what your plan might be for them. Perhaps maybe one of our children will, God would raise up to lead the nation back to himself. If we're willing to give your children back to the Lord for his purpose.